Now I'm going to deliver a, a, a lecture specifically on networks and the different types of networks, okay? And um, in order to explore this, I'm going to ask you to open up uh, a model. So we're going to be transitioning now to, um, to this uh, network uh, lecture. We saw an example of networks uh, within our last lecture associated with this income-based disparities in infection spread, right? Um, but now I'd like you to open up a model called SIRS model, ABM and SD for alternative networks. Now this one is separately posted on Moodle. So um, it's not part of the bigger package you would have downloaded last time of example models. This one is, is separately posted on Moodle as I recall, okay? So, um, uh, here, uh, sorry, um, SIRS model ABM and SD. So as its name uh, implies, it does include both a system dynamics and an agent-based component uh, that, that get compared and contrasted, okay? Um, so please get that loaded up and we can explore this a bit together. This model uh, has an agent-based characterization of the spread of infection. It has a system dynamics characterization of the spread of the same infection using a simple aggregate system dynamics model. And we're going to be examining the impact of networks on the context of each agent and on the dynamics of spread of an infection within the population. See how it affects things like the speed or completeness of that spread. And at the same time, illustrating different sorts of networks, which are quite common, okay? Um, we're gonna do this in half an hour, so I'm gonna move pretty quick. Um, so uh, if you open up this model, um, and you were to go run it with say this uh, baseline, uh, baseline run, what you will end up finding is a big circle and there it's superimposed over a, um, a system dynamics uh, model, an aggregate system dynamics model. Um, your uh, yeah. screen is still just facing Oh, is your... the screen not shared still? Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, much appreciated. There we go. Um, can you see it now? Yes. yes. Okay, that must be uh, a relief. Um, okay, so here we have a system dynamics model. Here we have susceptibles, infected, and recovered individuals. Um, and this is uh, characterized in a fashion where people can lose immunity, so they go back and flow to susceptible. Uh, but we also have agents, and these agents are arranged in a circle, and the color of people in the circle is going to be indicative of their status, okay? Um, so uh, it's going to be using a coloration scheme, not too different from what we saw last time, but not exactly the same. Susceptible will be green, red will be infective, and gray will be temporarily immune and, and recovered. Think of it as like gray ashes. Um, and uh, people will be situated in a network. This is a little bit uh, much to go look at, um, but you'll find uh, some interesting graphics above here by which we compare the system dynamics model state in a state, state space diagram versus the summarized state for the agent based model. Summarized because it's too high dimension to really depict in all its details, right? We, we talked about that. If you have N agents and each can be in two possible states, you've got two to the N possible states the system could be in. Instead, we've just summarized the number of susceptibles, the number of infectives here. Um, and uh, we're gonna compare here outputs from a system dynamics model on things like the number of susceptible, the number of infective with similar counts from the agent-based model, things like the number of 
infective individuals in that model. We're going to look at uh, connection counts um, uh, for this model and how a person's risk of infection and the number of times they've been infected varies with their, um, their number of connections, their so-called degree, the number of friends they have in the network, so to speak. Um, but before we do this, I think we're gonna switch to a model which has, or a scenario, an experiment which has a smaller population, just to make it a little bit more visually clear when we compare networks, okay? Um, so if you go and you run this one here, um, it's called population 100. You should be able to get something that looks like this. And you'll notice that a few individuals start infective uh, here. Um, we will go and, and through a bit of sleight of hand, I'm gonna use this. So I, I restarted here um, and I'm going to advance it to its very start and go, um, go switch over to this model, okay? Um, so now we're at this sort of very inception of things. And you'll notice that each of these hundred people is placed in a circle. Um, that's indicative of the fact that in, in Maine, the thing that contains the population uh, of people, it's in Maine, uh, if we scroll down, you'll find that I asked people to be laid out in a ring network here. Later, we'll, we'll alter that. But they're being laid out in this big ring, this big circle, okay? And they're being wired up to a randomly chosen connect set of 10 people. 10 people around them is to whom each person is connected willy-nilly. It, you know, just uh, with no locality, no preference for whom to be connected. It's not like I'm connected with nearby people. No, it's just any old 10 people across the network. And so it looks like a giant yarn ball or, or hair ball, right? Um, people are just connected willy-nilly. And if I go and I run this thing, one person starts infective and this person actually recovered here. And so the infection is not gonna spread at all right now. That was the luck of the draw. But remember, this depends on uh, the, the, the particular happenstance depends on the random seed. The, the chance draws from a, a random number distribution. I'm going to start it again um, and I'm gonna advance it here and we will start off. Here's one person back to the odd. Now that person, before they recovered, they seeded some. And you'll notice it's starting to spread. Each person is connected with people across the network. And so it, it spreads, you know, hither and yon all over the place, right? Uh, to people way, way yonder over, over the network uh, all around. And each of those people quickly becomes infected or immediately becomes infectious and they start spreading it. And so you get this big sort of lateral transfer of infection across the model. Now, Meanwhile, this, this same uh, system dynamics model is characterizing exactly the spread as well. Um, uh, so we have a, a number of infectives that it believes should be present, a number of susceptibles, a number of recovered. And you know, if you look at what the system dynamics model expects, um, that's shown in these kind of nice smooth lines, right? Um, so it's expecting, um, one of these uh, curves that uh, has a bit of oscillations in it, reflecting the delays associated with, uh, with recovery back to susceptible status and so on. We covered the dynamics of that before, um, uh, but you'll notice that right now it stands in quite some contrast to what happened. Early on, the two state spaces, that from the system dynamics model, susceptible on the x-axis, infective on the y-axis, um, and the one from the agent-based model, that's the blue one, the, 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 the uh, uh, brownish one is from the uh, system dynamics model. They kind of paralleled each other. We started with a lot of susceptibles, almost 100, 99 to be exact, and uh, we had one infective. And they kind of paralleled each other as it started to spread. 
but over time, you notice a kind of divergence. Um, the, the number of people infected in the Asian base model never grew quite as large as what you expect in the system dynamics model. Um, it came down to kind of a similar point, but then something happened. Anyone want to guess what happened here? What happened here? Anyone? Why is it we see this sudden drop off here? The infection died out. Infection died out. Happenstance, ladies and gentlemen. You have a population of 100. You know, if you have something like, so, so if you look here in the, in the SD models, you expect about five people infected, right? Um, that, that's what it, it is right now, about five. Um, you can have chance extinctions, right? Um, they just, they didn't infect uh, uh, enough people to keep it going. The people to whom they sent the messages were all recovered by chance. Um, or they send the infection to people who recovered and people who are currently infective as well. And it petered out by chance. And if you run this thing again, again, with this same network, you'll find kind of a similar phenomenon. Um, it, it, it tends to you know, might mirror this not terribly early on, but, but then it kind of diverges and because of small numbers involved, it'll, it'll commonly kind of die out at some point. Um, uh, and it's due to the luck of the draw. With 100 people, if you have just a handful of, of infectives, it can easily die out. By contrast, if we did that original one, um, going back to that, that original one we, we ran, um, we would have seen, if we had sort of run this and, and paid close attention up here, you'll notice the two are, are not far off. I mean, uh, it's not exactly characterized by it, but um, we do have more susceptibles in the ABM, um, but we have roughly the same number of of infectives, the, the difference is apparently coming out in the in the recovered. And if you look at any one time, the number of infectives in the ABM versus in the uh, in the SD model, that's the blue versus the red, respectively. Uh, you know, on average, it's it's not far off. The ABM is kind of has the uh, these oscillations, um, and you know, there's always a chance it'll go extinct. Like right here, it's getting awfully low. It could have gone extinct even there. And if you run it long enough, um, if you were to set this to run it definitely, you would find that indeed it can, uh, it can go extinct quite, quite, quite easily due to those fluctuations. Um, okay, so, um, uh, so that was one sort of network. That was a random network. The, the, the random network meant that each person was connected with a randomly chosen set of other individuals. And this, is, this goes by many names. It's called a Bernoulli network. It's called a Poisson random network. It's called an Erdos random network. Um, and any logic calls it a, a, a random network. Um, but fundamentally, there's no locality. Any two people are connected Regardless, um, you know, person A and person B is, are connected uh, regardless of any sort of proximity, regardless of whether they have a given friend in common, person C is known by both, uh, they're, they're connected by chance. Um, it just draws random people to whom they're connected. And particularly each pair of people is connected with a certain probability. Um, okay, um, so, we're going to be looking at several other network types. And bear in mind that some of these will take into account some notion of locality, most will in fact. Um, so we'll have locality defined either in terms of space or in terms of network structure, okay? Um, and we're going to, to take a look at uh, a variety of types of networks where we have different levels of locality. What we've just looked at now, there's no locality. 
there's no notion of two people are closer and therefore they deserve to be more likely to be connected. No notion they're more similar and they deserve to be connected. Um, okay, um, so uh, here we're going to be taking a look at a variety of types of networks. Um, let's go dive into this right now. We're gonna be sticking for now with network types leaving people in that ring so we can visually illustrate how they differ from each other. It, it'll be obvious how they differ from each other uh, visually. Certainly more obvious than if we just threw them down all over the place. So, so uh, we're gonna go in this model to main and we're going to scroll down to this area called space and network. You may have to expand that uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so in the space and network area, what you will see is a choice. Right now we have a Poisson random, a random in any logics vernacular uh, type of network. Let's instead choose here uh, a network which uh, exhibits dramatic amounts of, um, of, of locality, okay? Um, and uh, we're going to specifically look at something called a ring lattice network. Um, within this, all the connections are dictated by locality. Um, it's entirely dictated by locality, and particularly simple type of locality. 1D locality. It, everyone's in a ring, and so I have neighbors to my left and right, and I'm connected to neighbors to my left and right. And how many on each side is, is something we'll see we can set. So it's purely local connectivity in a 1D sense, one dimensional sense, just like you know this cord is, is essentially one dimensional. Um, soon enough, we'll be seeing two dimensional locality where we'll, you know, we'll put people, spread them down in a space um, that's, that's of two dimensions, um, but we'll come to that uh, a bit later. So this is 1D locality, okay? Um, and, uh, it's, uh, it's best that we uh, do this together. So I'm gonna pick here uh, a ring lattice and we wanna retain 10 connections per agent. That's what we add for random connections and to kind of compare apples with apples, we'll keep it at 10. And here they're gonna be connected with five on one side, five on the other, okay? Five, but five of their neighbors instead of five randomly chosen folks across the network. Okay, I just saved that. And now we'll run the same scenarios. So first with the population 100 to communicate visually what the distinction is. Um, so before, remember people are connected all across the network and this yarn ball, this hair ball of sorts. Now they're, where are the connections? You tell me, where are the connections? because they're around each other? Yeah, they're, they're just local. They're, one person is connected with others on either side. And not surprisingly, the infection is spreading locally, right? Um, one of these per persons was the first one and they can only spread it to their neighbors, right? Um, their hands are dying. They can't spread it way across. They can't send sparks flying way across the network that will ignite you know, people all across there, they can only spread it to their neighbors. So it spreads in this kind of localized constrained fashion. Now we can hop a bit because I'm connected with five people to the left, five to the right. So it can hop a bit, but can't go very far at a given time. It's speed of propagation is, is, is limited at a practical level. Um, and, you know, it is moving um, in a, in a fashion that reflects that, that uh, constraint. But more than that, the constraint also serves to kind of as a fire block, you know, a sort of a, a fire, fire door, uh, fire bulwark. Um, you notice these ones are recovered here. There's no way that anytime soon it's gonna be able to penetrate that firewall. Um, uh, you've, you've got it spreading from these, areas where it's, it's um, still active, but you know, once people are recovered until they, can, they lose their immunity, it's not to be able to spread through them. 
So if you go look here about how it's spreading, you'll find that it dramatically diverges from the random mixing we assumed in the system dynamics model. And in fact, from the version of this with a random network, it diverges as well. You know, it only matches for about the first 20 infections pretty closely what the system dynamics model did, uh, the aggregate model uh, with, you know, any susceptible can mix with any random where my chance as a person of a susceptible for getting infected just reflects the probability the, the proportion of people across the entire network who are who are infected. Remember that I over N term in the system dynamics aggregate model? C times I over N times beta times S. Remember that? Hope so. It's been a while since the last pop quiz. Um, but that that's like far different from this. This is this is going to uh, on a quite different trajectory. Its speed of propagation is really limited, um, and you'll you'll find it down here. Now it actually died out as well, and you can see it kind of all these people going back towards uh, towards full uh, susceptibility there, but. Um, over time, it's kind of crawling back here, but you know, it didn't really match particularly well what we thought. We thought we'd get a spike in the number of infectives that will come down. And this rose, but it didn't really rise to that level when it came down. So, so locality here, 1D locality, this locality of spreading in this sort of way um, along a kind of a, a line that happens to be curved round. Um, you know, really, really limited its spread. Now let's take a look at it though for a bigger model. After all, that was affected by, it dying out was affected a lot by chance um, to which it was particularly vulnerable because it, it had such a small population. So now let's try this. Oh my gosh, this one didn't even, didn't even get started. A thousand population, but we only start with one and it, it just didn't catch. Lucky, lucky simulation, that one. Um, okay, I just started it. It also spread, but it died out quickly. I'm not gonna even run it at full tilt. I'm having trouble getting one to, to get it to, to stay seated, okay? Um, this one also recovered before he infected people. Let's, um, let's try this some more, right? Um, okay, here it's spreading a bit, okay. Um, this is, this is, at least we got some data going on. Um, come on. Um, so I'm spreading it out. Okay, now, oh, now they're all recovered. It, it petered out. Look at this, folks. Look at this. It's like a pale cipher to the, to the full infection. Yeah, for the first little bit, it stays current, but then it peters out, right? Um, and if you run it again and again, you'll find this is not an uncommon occurrence. Um, the stochastics of the situation mean that it's limited options for spreading. If just a few people block you who are recovered by chance before they pass it on, it's blocked and it can't spread. It can't move that way. It can't move this way. Where's it gonna go? It dies out. Um, you can run it again and again and you'll find a disproportionate numbers of these uh, not even half the people get infected before it, it goes and peters out. Too constrained, too much structure. That's a 1D locality imposed on the system. Okay, so let's, let's um, continue on. We're gonna go to something called a small world network. We'll come back to 2D locality. That will require us to frob one more thing too. 2D locality, folks. Um, um, oh, sorry, not 2D locality. We'll come back to that. Um, small world. Uh, small world is a, is a combination of the first two that we've just seen. So we have on the one hand, a Poisson random network, which is any two people are connected with a certain probability. Any a pair of people is connected with a certain probability. No locality. On the other hand, a ring lattice. Two people are connected purely based on their locality. If they happen to be neighbors within, you know, a certain distance of each other, a small world is a weighted combination. So any given person 
is going to have a certain fraction of their connections dictated from their position along that line, essentially that circle. And, and the other, the balance, the, the, the remainder of their connections are gonna come from randomly chosen people across the world, across anywhere with no locality. Um, and uh, this sort of network is designed to be a reflection of the fact that, in fact, we as people often have a disproportionate number of local connections, but we know some people across the world. Um, and all it takes, it turns out, is a few of those long distance connections uh, to be common within a network. And you can get behavior that starts to get much more like a, a globally connected network, okay? Um, now, in any logic, you gotta watch out because there's, um, uh, for small world networks, uh, there's a different uh, characterization of, of the number of people to whom they're connected. So if we go here and we go into main, this is where we're gonna set the characteristics of the network to be imposed um, here. And we're going to have uh, connections per agent. Now, my note there suggests that it's off by a factor of, of, of uh, two, but um, uh, we're going we're gonna to test this. I think, I think it actually uh, may have been fixed in any logic sense. And connections per agent, we're going to say 10. And neighborhood length fraction, in other words, what fraction of those are local just to their neighbors? I'm going to say 95%, OK? Um, uh, maybe we'll say 90% 90, 90 so nine out of the 10 on average, okay? 90% uh, of them are locally connected. So now let's run. Uh, so here's a population of 100 and uh, we will go and look at this. And you'll notice that um, we no longer have, this is mostly local, but 10% of the connections are global to anyone. And so we have something that's kind of halfway between that just pure ring and this, this yarn ball where people are connected with people willy nilly across the network. Um, it's not as dense, but they do have some connections. And this, this chap, for example, uh, she's connected with, with people at several places across the network. So she has a chance of transmitting it, um, you know, way across the network. And in fact, you're starting to see that. You're starting to see it kind of propagate uh, at times um, to distant areas of the network. So now we're getting something which is not blocked by these firewalls as was the case in the ring lattice network. And you start to see something that is, again, at least not, absolutely, you know, abusively approximated by, by the system dynamics model. Uh, but it does die up, um, as did even the random network, as did the fully, uh, fully connected, uh, the, the one where it was all random. Let's go look at the full size population if we can. I'm aware of the time and uh, we're gonna be finishing up here shortly. Uh, so now I'm doing the full size. This is looking a bit more like a yarn ball um, because with even just 10% connected globally, you have uh, a significant chance that, um, or enough density that it, it's going to uh, be quite visually distinct. Um, so here, you know, it's, it's, it certainly doesn't go nearly as high the infection and it does die out. Let's try it uh, another time here, right? Um, so there we go. And, and once again, we got the same, same pattern. It's, it spreads a lot more than in a purely local network. This one never got off the ground. The, the, the initial individual didn't even get infected, but you have this, it's much, much closer than it was with a ring lattice network where it just veered off after about the first 20. But, but it still doesn't stay permanently infected due to die out. It, it actually 
tends to die out of this uh, with the luck of the draw and um, it, whether it goes many times or just you know, goes through one cycle is another matter. This one actually iterated a bunch, but note that it's equilibrium of sorts around which it was circulating stochastically has a lot more susceptibles than in fact is. Um, uh, a lot more susceptibles than does the SD one. Um, so there's a shifting that's gone on due to network structure. The infection is propagated differently and you get these more sort of pronounced cycles associated with it that you will see even in this sort of context. Remember we saw whispering of that in the case of the Poisson random network where we saw these fluctuations around this mean. But here they're large enough and pronounced enough that it actually dies out. Okay, so this was for a small world network. A small world network, this is really testable stuff, is this weighted combination of pure locality and pure global connections willy-nilly. Um, most of the connections are local with the ring lattice logic and a small fraction typically are, are, are random. Um, okay. Um, now, one thing we're gonna be talked about quite a bit next time, but which I'll just hit on briefly here is um, there's a key realization that's come out of a lot of work on an infectious diseases, but it's extended well beyond that. Um, and, uh, and it's particular, particularly emphasized in the context of network-based models and uh, agent-based modeling. And it has to do with the fact that in some situations, um, and it's not uncommon to be in situations where the tail wags the dog. A small fraction of individuals has this disproportionate impact on the population. And particularly people who have lots of connections if you think about it, in an infectious disease context, they're much more likely to get infected in the first place. They can get infected through anyone around them, right? And so they're kind of like a magnet for getting infected, but they're also disproportionately important in disseminating that infection to others. If they get infected, they could spread it to a huge number of different people. And these individuals have attracted a great deal of attention um, uh, because uh, amongst other things, if we can better protect them, um, better prevent the infection in them, um, better prevent it propagating, detect it sooner and get them in for isolation, for example, we can often prevent it from, uh, from spreading very, very widely. We can really lower, you know, by focusing on 1% of the population, you can lower the, the amount of infection by 50% or something like that. And the classic thing we'll be talking about next time is scale-free networks. Um, and it turns out that a wide variety of systems out there, including some aspects of human interactions as we've shown through our smartphone studies, um, can be fairly well approximated with these things called scale-free networks. And basically what this is saying is it's scale-free in the sense that no matter what scale you look at, um, the probability of within the next hour, say having you know, X number of, of connections within that hour versus two X goes down. Um, um, so so the, the probability of having two X versus X um, is the same regardless of what, what X is. So maybe it's uh, two, meeting two people rather than one versus the probability of meeting 10 people instead of five versus the probability of meeting 100 instead of 50. Turns out that, that um, uh, at a wide variety of scales of numbers of connections, uh, you have this, this invariance to, to scale where your probability of having twice as many connections in a given period of time has that same ratio of occurrences to the, to the current number, regardless of, of the number of connections you're talking about. We'll come back to this next time and I'll, I'll give it a better uh, explanation. But we, to characterize these situations, these situations um, 
if you look at people tend to be characterized by situations where people, certain people have a, a disproportionate number of connections, but um, those people tend to be small in number. So there are some people who have tons and tons of connections and some who have very few. Um, uh, I had spoken earlier with the smartphone studies about connections per unit time. Here we're dealing with the number of connections a person has. And so if we consider people with, you know, who, um, who, have, who meet on a per month basis, let's say 20 people versus 10, um, maybe one quarter as many people meet 20 people per month as meet 10. And by the same token, one quarter as many people meet 100 people per month than meet uh, 100 per month. And the people who tend to have a disproportionate number of meetings per month or contacts, um, whether it's needle sharing contacts, sexual transmissions, people they meet up with socially, et cetera, um, these people tend to be called hubs or, or, um, or, or to be these individuals who are, who are distinguished within these as being high degree nodes, having lots of connections. So we're gonna look at a scale-free network very briefly, and then we'll finish with the, uh, the 2D network. So scale-free, um, we just go to main here and we will look at a scale-free network with a, an M, uh, which basically is gonna help determine the number of hubs, the number of these people with huge numbers of connections. Uh, and if we run this, and this is with the full size population, uh, we will see we have a persistence of infection that is retained over even a large period of time. Okay, um, so here it actually stays present. And if you look at this degree versus infection count, you'll find some people have very high number of degrees, but have a very high number of connections whereas most have comparatively few. Um, and uh, the infection, once again, is not that far off from the, um, from the case with, uh, with a system dynamics model. It kind of oscillates around that. Uh, I do wanna show that for a smaller uh, number of, of individual, or for a smaller population. Um, here, uh, you may not notice it immediately, but most people have a comparatively smaller number of connections and some people have a very dense set, that particular group down here, have a very, very dense set of connections. This is indicative of a, uh, of a scale-free network. Uh, there are some people with tons of connections and most people have, have comparatively few. So that's a scale-free. The final thing I wanna finish with is 2D locality. And uh, to finish that, what we're going to do is if we click on main, uh, mind you, um, I'm gonna be changing something. If you wanna experiment with this model later, you can re-download it um, or remember to change this back. I'm gonna change their layout. Instead of having them defined in a uh, ring lattice, um, I want them scattered because I wanna connect them with connections by based on how close they are. And so we need them to be spread out over the landscape. And so we're gonna have a distance-based network, okay? Um, so they're laid out in a random way and connected in a distance-based fashion. And here we go. So I'm gonna uh, do it with a larger population first and then a smaller. Um, so here we, are, we have 2D locality. And you notice the infection is spreading locally, it's spreading across the network in a incremental fashion. Um, it's not quite like a ring lattice where you have blocking going on because you can move in different directions. Um, there's not these firewalls, uh, but there's still this greater propensity for it to die out. And indeed it, it has died out. Um, and you'll see the effects of that locality writ large here. It's departing from, um, what we see with a with an aggregate model, I'll I'll spread it uh, again, and you'll notice that a lot of the restraints here that were present in that one D network where it was spreading along a line are present here as well, 
just not as stiff. Um, you can uh, you can still see that because of the the requirement of a spatial spread, you get the spread in waves. You saw it there uh, briefly, and I'll I'll show it again here. Um, this one didn't even catch because of stochastics, but you see it spread out. Uh, also, didn't catch. Um, you see it spread out across the network in this way, that that reflects the fact that it's, you know, it's spreading in a localized fashion. It can't can't jump arbitrarily because there's no network connection that goes arbitrarily far. It's all local connections. Um, so this is a distanced based network. Um, we connect two people if they are uh, live within a certain distance of each other. Um, with a, sm a very small population, people are going to be largely disconnected, and they're not going. To, it's not going to spread worth beans because it has nowhere to go. Right? It needs a certain population size to knit everyone together, and then it can spread quite far, but in a constrained way. It can't leap and leap and leap with sparks flying to the distant areas. It can only spread locally, just not in quite as constrained a way as in a 1D network. Ladies and gentlemen, networks are central to your assignment, th assignment three, your problem set three. And if you've internalized the elements from this lecture, if you've seen how I frobbed these models, seen how I set things, you should have a very good leg up on that problem set. And uh, these models should provide a useful reference for pursuing that as well. Um, so I look forward to answering any questions on this in office hours within just a few minutes. Thank you very much.